Number 9. Lauren K. Scott In June of 2017, an adult film actress was arrested for hitting a man with whom she was involved in an intimate relationship. 23-year-old Lauren K. Scott, professionally known as Dakota Sky, was at the home of boyfriend Robert Anderson in Pinellas Park, Florida. They'd reportedly been seeing each other for roughly six months, even though Las Vegas marriage records indicated that, at the time, Scott was married to agent Zachary Lecomte Goble. After she and Anderson had had intercourse, the former became angry that Scott wasn't paying attention to him and wouldn't get off her phone. An argument ensued that culminated with the adult actress striking him in the face with an open right hand, split and open his bottom lip. He called the authorities and Scott was arrested, listing the adult industry as her employer in the resulting affidavit. She was charged with misdemeanor domestic battery and released on her own recognizance, but the charges were ultimately dropped. It's unclear if drugs or alcohol had been involved in the incident, but Scott was known to have struggled with severe addiction. A few years after the battery incident, on June the 8th of 2021, she called friends to say that she was going to become a Hell's Angel biker because the police and the mafia were after her. She reportedly asked them for a place to stay on the night, but everyone refused her. The woman who'd appeared in over 300 films and had once been among the top searches on adult websites was found dead the following day in a stranger's RV on Los Angeles's Skid Row. The cause of her passing remained undetermined as of the latest updates on the matter. Number 8. New Jersey Woman An unnamed New Jersey woman took a hard fall in June of 2017 as she was walking on the street in Plainfield and got distracted by her cell phone. The 67-year-old woman approached basement doors which had been left open for gas line repairs. The woman kept looking at her phone and didn't turn to avoid them. She flipped over a door and plunged headfirst roughly six feet into the basement. The woman, whose son claims suffered from poor eyesight, was pulled out on a stretcher by fire crews. She was reported to have sustained serious injuries in the fall but was subsequently pronounced as being in a stable condition. Number 7. Charlotte Buesden An inquest into the traffic collision death of an English woman proposed in early 22 that she'd lost control of her vehicle while watching an episode of a reality TV show on her cell phone. On August the 23rd of the previous year, Charlotte Buesden was traveling on a busy road in Kemsley, Kent, in her Nissan Qashqai. At around 7.30 a.m., shortly after dropping her son off at school, Buesden veered into oncoming traffic, a lorry driver, which the inquest concluded had had no chance of avoiding the 28-year-old's Nissan, crashed into her. Buesden succumbed to a severe skull fracture in the aftermath. Her phone was found attached to a magnetic clip on the dashboard and displaying an error message, which indicated that the device had become disconnected from an episode of Love Island. Dashcam footage from the lorry was of poor quality, according to the authorities, but it did appear to show that Buesden had been looking in the direction of her phone and then moving her arm towards where it had been mounted. It was thus suspected that she hadn't been paying attention while driving because she'd been watching the show. Number 6. Sarah Fullard On June the 3rd of 2021, Englishwoman Sarah Fullard had finished assembling a flat-pack coffee table in the garden of her home in Hull, East Yorkshire. A neighbor later recounted seeing Fullard at work and how she appeared to be excited she had managed to put it up herself. The 42-year-old reportedly decided to celebrate the completed project by pouring herself a few drinks. When the unnamed neighbor looked over the fence once more, he saw her slumped over the coffee table and immediately called the emergency services. Fullard was subsequently pronounced dead and a post-mortem found the cause to have been positional asphyxia. It was determined that at some point the woman had tripped over the same coffee table she'd previously assembled. She was knocked unconscious in the fall and ended up in a position that rendered her unable to breathe. The examination found that Fullard had moderate to severe alcohol intoxication, but although it was regarded as increasing the risk of a fall, alcohol wasn't listed as the primary factor in the accident. Additionally, Fullard's liver was reported as being in healthy condition, suggesting she'd never been a heavy drinker. Number 5. Tejas Patel 24-year-old Tejas Patel died in January of 2015 after accidentally stepping in front of a train at the Morningside Station in Auckland, New Zealand. Patel had gotten off a passenger train while reportedly looking into his cell phone and as another train was approaching from the opposite direction, 
It was below the maximum line speed at the time while barriers and warnings were reportedly working accurately. Seemingly unaware of his surroundings, Patel walked from the platform through an unguarded opening and in doing so, ended up directly in the path of the oncoming train. He was struck and killed instantly. In the tragedy's aftermath, Patel's mother asked for enhanced safety measures at the country's rail crossings, while Auckland's Indian community raised $10,000 for Patel's father to accompany his body back to India. A report from the Transport Accident Investigation Commission found that the rail operators and providers had to take cell phone use into their risk assessment when designing or implementing rail safety. Number 4. Craig Harding 60-year-old Englishwoman Marilyn McKnight was left with life-changing injuries following a devastating car accident that took place on Mother's Day 2015. She'd been traveling in a Ford car with her son and daughter-in-law to visit her elderly mother. Craig Harding, age 44, was behind the wheel of a Volkswagen Polo and not paying attention to the road in front because he was looking at an accident on the other side of the A19 near Hutton Henry, County Durham. In doing so, Harding failed to notice that the cars in front had slowed down and slammed into the back of the Ford at considerable speed, nearly toppling it on its roof. Much like Harding, McKnight's family wasn't reported as being in life-threatening condition, but the woman received extensive treatment at the scene prior to being airlifted to a hospital. McKnight became permanently blind in one eye and sustained severe spinal injuries that rendered her unable to walk and only have minimal movement in her arms. Police subsequently released a video of the harrowing crash in an effort to raise awareness to the dangers of being distracted at the wheel. Harding, who admitted he'd been momentarily distracted, was charged with causing serious injury by dangerous driving and sentenced to 10 months in prison. Number 3. Elena Gladkika On a Sunday morning in September of 2016, married beauty consultant Elena Gladkika and her lover were having drinks while watching the sunrise on the roof of her midtown Manhattan apartment building. The pair got locked out at some point, and after exhausting all avenues for regaining access, 27-year-old Gladkika called her husband to let her back inside. As she waited and as her date was hiding on the roof, Gladkika reportedly dangled her legs over a ledge. The woman, who was reported as inebriated at the time, then lost her footing and fell from the five-story building at 449 West 37th Street. The New York Post reported that when Gladkika's husband eventually made his way to the roof, he was told that she'd fallen by the other man. Gladkika's body became trapped between two buildings and the fire department had to borrow a ladder from a porter to reach her. Gladkika, who'd only been wearing a brassiere and underwear when rescuers found her, was subsequently pronounced dead at Bellevue Hospital. In the immediate aftermath, the woman's distraught husband told a media outlet that he was scrambling to get in touch with his late spouse's relatives in her native Russia. Number 2. Uroko Onoja An argument within a polygamous marriage ended in the death of a Nigerian man in the summer of 2012. In the early hours of the morning, Uroko Onoja returned to his home in Ogbugbo, Ogbadibo, after spending some time at a local bar. He headed to the bedroom with only the youngest of his six wives and they became intimate. The other women flew into a fit of collective rage because they weren't receiving the same type of attention. They reportedly burst into the bedroom and set upon Onoja with knives and sticks, demanding he have intercourse with each of them as well. According to Nigeria's Daily Post, the man had attempted to resist the demands of his wives but was ultimately overpowered. He was forced to perform as ordered with four of the women in succession. However, as the fifth was making her way to bed, Onolja stopped breathing. The businessman, described as a philanthropist and a positive contributor to his community, couldn't be resuscitated. His youngest wife subsequently told the authorities that the others had fled into the forest upon realizing their husband was unresponsive. Local media would later report that he'd been abused to death and at least two of his wives were arrested. Number 1 accident in Oklahoma. Six Oklahoma teenagers were killed in a car crash on March the 22nd of 2022, after the vehicle in which they'd been traveling was struck by a semi-truck at a notoriously dangerous intersection. Near Tishomingo, Madison Robertson was driving while accompanied by five friends in a 2015 Chevrolet Spark. A small car only meant to seat four, the passengers were identified as Gracie Mercado, Brooklyn Triplett, Austin Holt, Addison Gratz 
and Memory Wilson, Robertson approached the stop sign at an intersection locally known as the Y, found at a 90-degree curve of US-377 from east to south. The junction had long been criticized by residents for how easy it was for drivers to pull into oncoming traffic, but their pleas for changes had largely gone unanswered. In spite of the well-known dangers, reports suggested that Robertson hadn't paid adequate attention to the oncoming truck while also reportedly rolling through the stop sign. 51-year-old Bernieville man Valendon Burton was driving the semi, which was hauling rocks at the time. He plowed into the Chevrolet and the devastating impact mangled the smaller car ripping its doors off and throwing it roughly 300 feet from the intersection. Four of the teens, including Robertson, died at the scene while the remaining two passed away at a local hospital. A review by the National Transportation Safety Board found that Robertson had cannabis in her system and that she'd also violated the law by driving on an intermediate license while not having a fully qualified driver aged 21 or older supervising her. Burton, who didn't suffer any serious injuries in the crash, hadn't been charged in connection to it as of early May 2022. Number 7. Anne-Marie Law enforcement in Atlanta, Georgia, responded to reports of a shooting at the Buckhead Intercontinental Hotel on December the 1st of 2020. Upon their arrival, police officers found Jonathan Wright lying on the floor of a room after having sustained an apparent gunshot wound to the head. Despite the victim's critical injury, he was reportedly able to communicate with the officers and answer some of their questions before being transported to Grady Memorial Hospital for treatment. The police also spoke with 25-year-old musician Joanne Marie Slater. She had released a Billboard charting R&B single titled Secret in 2019 under the stage name Anne Marie. According to subsequent police reports, Slater had been in the hallway in a state of distress when officers arrived at the scene. She claimed that a gun had fallen off a table and accidentally discharged, striking right in the head. Her version of the events didn't align with the physical evidence collected in the hotel room. Investigators reportedly found two shell casings lodged in the bathroom door and one at the foot of the bed, indicating that multiple shots had been fired. Slater was arrested for shooting Wright, whom she'd described as her best friend since childhood. She faced charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. After being held at the Fulton County Jail, Slater was released on bond, whereupon she was ordered to remain on house arrest. The Chicago Tribune reported that the singer was prohibited from making contact with Wright or his family and was also forbidden from possessing guns of any kind. Number 6. Tim Lambesis In the early 2010s, Tim Lambesis, the lead singer for the California metalcore band As I Lay Dying, separated from Megan, his wife of eight years. Court records detailed how in 2013, Lambesis was unhappy with what he perceived to be his estranged wife's intention of limiting his access to their three adopted children. The 33-year-old also reportedly became dispirited and angry about the amount of money Megan would receive in a potential divorce settlement. It was around that time that the metal vocalist began devising a plan to have his wife killed. On two separate occasions, Lambesis allegedly approached an individual at the gym about his murder plot and, shortly thereafter, got in contact with someone whom he believed to be a hitman. Upon reaching an agreement with the contract killer, Lambesis gave him an envelope containing $1,000 in cash, photographs of his wife, her home address, and the code needed to get through her security gate. In order to establish a solid alibi for himself, Lambesis planned to have the murder committed while he was with his children. However, on May the 7th of 2013, the singer was taken into police custody on a charge of solicitation of murder. It subsequently emerged that the hitman Lambesis had hired was actually an undercover detective. The audio recording of their transaction was played during the case's legal proceedings, which culminated in May of 2014 with Lambesis being sentenced to six years in prison. He was released on parole in December of 2016 and subsequently reunited with the other members of As I Lay Dying. The band released an album titled Shaped by Fire in 2019. Number 5. Ari Lennox Ari Lennox, an R&B singer signed to rapper J. Cole's Dreamville Records, was taken into custody at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam on November the 29th of 2021. Initial reports on the incident indicated that the 30-year-old had been excessively confrontational towards an airline employee in the moments leading up to her arrest. According to a spokesperson for the Netherlands National Police Force, airport security had suspected that Lennox was intoxicated when they 
detained her for displaying what was described as aggressive behavior. It was also subsequently reported that the Royal Netherlands Marechaussee was investigating threats that Lennox had allegedly directed towards the airline employee and a security officer during the incident. In the wake of her arrest, the musician sent out a series of tweets detailing her perspective on what had transpired. Lennox revealed that she'd gotten into an argument with a female staff member for allegedly racially profiling her, and also accused Amsterdam security of hating black people. Her social media updates on the situation garnered widespread support from members of her fan base, many of whom considered her arrest to have been unjust and discriminatory. Number 4. Gretchen Wilson on August the 21st of 2018, Connecticut State Police received reports of a minor disturbance on an incoming flight to Bradley International Airport in Windsor Locks near Hartford. According to an American Airlines spokesperson, two passengers had gotten into an altercation during the flight, prompting the airline to request that law enforcement meet the aircraft upon its arrival. State troopers subsequently conducted interviews with the plane's passengers on the airport tarmac in an effort to establish the sequence of events that had occurred on the flight. While they were speaking with a middle-aged woman later identified as country singer Gretchen Wilson, she reportedly became belligerent to the extent that she was taken into custody and charged with misdemeanor breach of peace. It was later detailed how Wilson had allegedly shoved a fellow passenger on the plane after they'd gotten to the bathroom before her. The pair proceeded to make threatening hand gestures towards one another throughout the remainder of the flight. 45-year-old Wilson, who rose to prominence after releasing the Grammy Award-winning single Redneck Woman in 2004, confessed to being saddened and embarrassed by the incident during an interview with Taste of Country. Number 3. Sam Hunt Police in Nashville, Tennessee received reports of a vehicle traveling the wrong way down the northbound lanes of Ellington Parkway in the early hours of November the 21st of 2019. When officers arrived at the scene, they initiated a traffic stop. After reportedly witnessing the car in question, swerving in and out of its lane, the driver was identified as 34-year-old Sam Hunt, a popular country music artist from the Nashville area. The resulting police report described Hunt as having had bloodshot eyes and the officers also noted an obvious odor consistent with alcoholic beverage. Two empty beer cans were found in the passenger seat of the vehicle and the singer reportedly had trouble finding his driver's license, instead handing the police his credit card and passport at certain points during the traffic stop. He ultimately agreed to perform a field sobriety test in which he allegedly showed obvious signs of impairment. It later emerged that Hunt had been operating his vehicle with a blood alcohol content of 0.173, more than twice the legal driving limit in Tennessee. He was arrested and taken to the Metro Davidson County Detention Facility on charges of driving under the influence and possessing an open container. In August of 2021, it was reported that Hunt had pleaded guilty to his charges and was consequently given a suspended jail sentence of 11 months and 29 days. The Grammy Award nominee was also ordered to complete an alcohol safety course and his driver's license was suspended for one year. Number two. Big Lurch Antron Singleton, who rapped under the name Big Lurch, emerged on the hip-hop scene in the late 1990s as one of the founding members of the California rap group Cosmic Slop Shop. The group's debut 1998 record proved to be a commercial disappointment, despite the single Sinful peaking on the Billboard Top 100. They disbanded without recording a second album and Singleton largely disappeared from public attention in the aftermath. Then, in April of 2002, he made international headlines after he was arrested for the gruesome murder of his roommate, 21-year-old Tanisha Isis. According to eyewitness testimony on the night of April the 10th, the rapper had been partying with a group of friends at the apartment he and Isis shared. Singleton later recounted how they began smoking PCP and shortly thereafter, he told everyone to leave except Isis. He then launched a brutal attack on his roommate, during which he allegedly used a knife to cut open her chest. The police later came upon the man covered in blood, walking naked through the street. A medical examination uncovered that he had human flesh in his stomach and investigators determined that he'd eaten pieces of Isis's body after murdering her. Singleton pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to charges of murder and aggravated mayhem, but he was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the years since his incarceration, the rapper maintained that he had no memory of the murder and also contended that he'd experienced drug-induced amnesia for nearly two weeks after his arrest. Number 1. Varg Vikernes In August of 1993, Norwegian black metal musician Varg Vikernes 
drove from the city of Bergen to the Oslo residence of Oyston, Arseth, better known by the stage name Euronymous. The two men had previously been part of the influential black metal band Mayhem, but experienced a falling out in early 1993. On the night of August 10th, Vikernes killed his former bandmate by stabbing him multiple times. Euronymous's body was later found outside his apartment with 23 lacerations to his head, neck, and back. Although the Norwegian media initially blamed a death on black metal artists from Sweden, it was reportedly shortly thereafter that Vikernes had been found responsible for the murder. Following his arrest, it emerged that Vikernes was not only facing criminal consequences in connection to the deadly stabbing, but also for a series of arson attacks on Christian churches that he carried out between 1992 and 1993. The prominent black metal artist faced further charges after the authorities found more than 330 pounds of explosives in his possession, which he'd allegedly intended to use towards the destruction of the Blitz House, a communist and anarchist social center in Oslo. In May of 1994, Vikernes was convicted on all counts levied against him. Despite his claims that he'd actually killed Euronymous in self-defense, he was sentenced to 21 years in prison, which was the maximum penalty possible under Norwegian law. While incarcerated, Vikernes started the Norwegian Heathen Front, an international neo-Nazi organization. Upon his release from prison in 2009, he continued making and releasing music under the name Burzum. He also uploaded video blogs to a YouTube channel called Thulean Perspective, which has since been deleted from the platform. Although Vikernes has publicly disavowed Nazism in recent years, his extreme political and religious views, along with his past crimes and convictions, have led to him being labeled the most notorious metal musician of all time. Number 7. The Gardener Expressway Collision on March the 23rd of 2021, a Toronto nurse was involved in a harrowing collision with a dump truck on the Gardiner Expressway. At the time of the incident, 26-year-old Courtney Earhart was driving her Mini Cooper to work, where she'd been helping vaccinate homeless people in the area. At about 10 a.m., she was rear-ended by a dump truck as she was merging onto the westbound ramp near the intersection of Lakeshore Boulevard and Jarvis Street. Her vehicle was flipped sideways as the truck proceeded to push her up the ramp. The trucker was seemingly oblivious to the fact that Earhart's Mini Cooper had become lodged beneath his bumper and he continued pushing her for more than 2,000 feet, which is a distance greater than that of five football fields. A couple who'd witnessed the entire ordeal was able to pull in front of the dump truck and finally get the driver to stop. Earhart was examined by paramedics who'd been called to the scene. While she was sore and shocked, the nurse fortunately came away without any serious injuries and she consequently didn't have to go to the hospital. The driver of the truck was reportedly shaken upon realizing what had transpired and he was charged with several traffic-related offenses. Number 6. Rogel Lazaro Aguilera Maderos a 25-year-old truck driver faced criminal charges after he lost control of his vehicle and caused a fiery crash among a Colorado mountain highway on April the 15th of 2019. The Texas-based trucker was identified as Rogel Lazaro Aguilero Maderos, who was hauling lumber in his semi-trailer when the devastating accident occurred. It was reported that the brakes to Aguilero Maderos' truck were failing at the time of the incident, causing him to travel down Interstate 70 at speeds of up to 85 miles per hour. He allegedly passed a total of four runaway truck ramps along the roadway, instead attempting to weave dangerously in and out of traffic. At one point, the trucker was driving along the shoulder and aimed to clip the back of a parked semi. In order to reduce his vehicle's momentum, Aguilera Maderos's last-ditch efforts were unsuccessful and he ultimately plowed into stopped traffic, triggering a 28-car pileup that took the lives of four individuals. During his trial, Aguilera Medeiros admitted that he'd never driven along the Colorado mountains before and was unfamiliar with the interstate. In October of 2021, he was convicted on 27 counts, four of which were vehicular homicide. Number 5. Wayne Adam Ford a trucker from Petaluma, California confessed to carrying out a series of violent murders between 1997 and 1998. Wayne Adam Ford began working as a long-haul trucker after he'd gotten divorced from his wife and moved to the Northern California coast. The first dead body that was linked to Ford was found in October of 1997 
Authorities believe the female victim had been a hitchhiker picked up by the truck driver prior to her death. Identification was made impossible by the extreme dismemberment of her corpse. Ford had taken her various body parts to different locations and he allegedly attempted to cook some of them after storing them in his freezer. The trucker's next victims were a pair of escorts, identified as 26-year-old Tina Renee Gibbs and Lynette Dayon White, aged 25, whose nude bodies were discovered in June and October of 1998, respectively. Ford's final victim was Patricia Ann Tamis, whose body was found floating in the California aqueduct in San Bernardino County. Roughly a week later, Ford turned himself into the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department. He walked into the office with Tamiz's severed breast in his pocket. Ford ultimately confessed to the four murders, but investigators have theorized that the trucker may have been responsible for other killings as well. He was charged with four counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to death in August of 2006. Number 4. Timothy J. Vafidis In November of 2016, a Utah trucker was found guilty of enslaving women in his semi-trailer as he drove across the United States. Timothy J. Vafidis was first brought into custody in 2014 after police officers at a Minnesota way station noticed bruises on the face of a 19-year-old woman who was traveling with the truck driver. Upon further investigation, it emerged that the young woman had previously filed a restraining order against Vafidis that prohibited him from contacting her. Vafidis had attacked her when she'd attempted to leave him, inflicting the bruises that ultimately caught the attention of law enforcement officials. Following the trucker's arrest, a second woman came forward and reported that she'd been held captive in Vafidis' truck in a similar manner as the first victim when she was 18 years of age. In the ensuing court proceedings, it was established that Vafidis had abused a total of six women. He faced charges in connection to only two of them, however, as the other cases were reportedly too old for legal action to be taken. Vafidis was allegedly obsessed with vampires and he branded his truck the Twilight Express. It was revealed in court that the driver regularly assaulted his victims after trapping them in his semi-trailer and forcibly grinding down their teeth. Vafidis, who was dubbed the Vampire Trucker by certain media outlets, pleaded guilty to the charges levied against him and he was subsequently sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. Number 3. Bruce Mendenhall A long-haul truck driver from Albion, Illinois, was found to have been responsible for a string of serial killings at various truck stops across the US. On July the 12th of 2007, Bruce Mendenhall was remanded into custody at the TA truck stop off Interstate 24 in Nashville, Tennessee, while investigating the murder of Sarah Nicole Hulbert, which had taken place at the same stop just a few weeks prior. A local detective identified Mendenhall's truck as the same one that had been spotted on surveillance cameras on the night of the young woman's death. Upon inspecting Mendenhall's vehicle, law enforcement officials discovered the presence of bloody clothing in a plastic sack and also found splotches of blood all over the cab, including on the steering wheel. After his arrest, Mendenhall implicated himself in at least two additional murders while being interviewed by investigators. The targets of his violent attacks were primarily young female escorts. Although he was ultimately charged with the murders of four women whom he'd picked up at truck stops in Alabama, Tennessee and Indiana, he was still under investigation for murders in five other states at the time of his incarceration. While serving out the multiple life sentences he'd been given, Mendenhall was sentenced to an additional 30 years behind bars after it was discovered that he tried to arrange the murders of three witnesses from his trial. Number 2. Jordan Alexander Barson A 45-year-old truck driver was sentenced to a prison term of 16 years after he was convicted on a charge of causing death while driving under the influence of methamphetamine. On December the 10th of 2020, the box truck operated by Jordan Alexander Barson of Kingman, Arizona, struck a safety escort vehicle that was following behind a group of about 20 bicyclists riding on a stretch of US Highway 95, south of Boulder City, Nevada. The escort then plowed into the vulnerable cyclists, claiming the lives of five and seriously injuring two others. One of the wounded victims was airlifted to a nearby hospital while the other was transported via an ambulance in critical condition. 
A third bicyclist also suffered minor wounds. It was reported that Barson had remained at the scene after the fatal collision until the arrival of Nevada Highway Patrol officials, who examined the brakes, tires, and overall functionality of his vehicle. The commercial truck driver told investigators that he'd fallen asleep at the wheel while driving his normal work route. According to court records, Barson's blood was tested, revealing that the man's body contained nine times the amount of methamphetamine necessary to indicate impairment. Barson ultimately agreed to a plea deal with prosecutors which avoided trial on 14 felony charges that could have resulted in a life sentence. In addition to the 16 years, Barson was ultimately sentenced to serve. The Clark County District Court judge that presided over the trucker's case ordered the defendant to pay nearly $60,000 in restitution to the victims of the crash. Number 1. Clark Perry Baldwin a former long-haul trucker was taken into police custody in May of 2020 after it was discovered that he'd perpetrated the murders of three women during the early 1990s. Clark Perry Baldwin, who was in his late 50s at the time of his arrest, had worked as a truck driver from the second half of the 1980s until the mid-1990s. His first alleged victim was a 32-year-old pregnant woman by the name of Pamela Rose McCall, who'd last been seen climbing into a tractor trailer at a truck stop in Tennessee. Her body was eventually found a few miles from the stop in March of 1991, and it was determined that she'd been strangled to death. The following year, Baldwin carried out two more slayings in Wyoming. The strangled, unclothed body of a young woman was found by a female truck driver near Interstate 80. The unidentified victim was referred to as Bitter Creek Betty. A month later, the remains of a pregnant woman were discovered off of Interstate 90, which led to the victim being dubbed I-90 Jane Doe. While each of the murder cases had gone cold for nearly three decades, investigators were able to finally identify Baldwin as the killer through the use of genetic genealogy. DNA that had been uploaded to a genealogy site by one of the suspect's relatives was used to link the former trucker to evidence found at the original crime scenes. Baldwin was subsequently arrested at his home in Waterloo, Iowa. He faced multiple counts of first-degree murder in connection to his violent crimes. The ex-truck driver had been arrested about a month prior to the murder of McCall after he'd been accused of strangling a woman in a truck in Texas, but all charges in that case were dismissed because the victim had failed to show up to court. Number 8. Casey Garcia a Texas mother was arrested in 2021 for sneaking into a middle school while pretending to be her teenage daughter. Casey Garcia later explained her actions as a social experiment meant to test campus security. The 30-year-old woman stood at 4 feet 11 inches tall and weighed around 105 pounds, a physical frame that easily enabled her to pass as a student. She dyed her hair, used skin tanner, and dressed as her child before entering the premises of the Garcia Enriquez Middle School campus in San Elizario, about 20 miles southeast of El Paso. She wore a face mask and provided her daughter's ID number, consequently being allowed to access to the building. Videos circulating on social media showed Garcia greeting others in the school and also attending classes. She'd managed to make it through the morning and most of the afternoon before she was spotted by a teacher and ultimately turned herself in to the principal. She was arrested by El Paso County Sheriff's Office deputies for tampering with government records and criminal trespass. According to the superintendent for the school district of San Elizario, officials were reviewing and improving their security protocols in the incident's wake. Number 7. Sarah Brady In April of 2020, as stay-at-home orders were widespread across the U.S., an Idaho mother was arrested as part of a group urging others in the state to protest anti-coronavirus prevention measures. Local police approached 40-year-old Sarah Brady at a playdate protest staged at a closed playground in Kleiner Park in Meridian. The officers repeatedly asked her and the others to disperse. Brady, who was also affiliated with at least one anti-vaccine group, refused to leave, turned around with her hands behind her back and dared officers to arrest her. A video of her being taken into custody subsequently began circulating on social media. Brady was charged for trespassing and violating city orders but was released after posting a $300 bond. Less than a week after her arrest, the mother apologized for her behavior in the police encounter, claiming that her frustration over recent restrictions had gotten the better of her. Number 6. 
Lexus Stag. In June of 2019, a Houston mother was charged with killing her son as a consequence of what prosecutors reported had been a failed game of chicken. Surveillance footage from a community pool showed that 26-year-old Lexus Stag had been driving a Lincoln Navigator in reverse as three children were chasing after it. She then put the vehicle in drive and moved towards them. Two were able to get out of the way but her son, identified as Lord Renfro, was struck by the SUV. He later passed away at Memorial Hermann Southwest Hospital. Stag was released after being interviewed by the police and after it had been determined she wasn't intoxicated. Her son's death was initially investigated as an accident but, after reports of the game emerged, Stag was charged with criminal negligent homicide. Speaking on the incident, the Harris County District Attorney told the media, cars aren't toys and playing chicken with your kids isn't a game. Number 5. Daphne Mellin a video began circulating on Facebook and YouTube in September of 2011 of a mother encouraging her pre-teen daughter to fight a bully before attacking a child herself. According to Daphne Mellin, her 12-year-old daughter named as Jade had been bullied and threatened online by another student of the William Floyd Elementary School in Long Island, New York. Mellin, a mother of three, reported that she'd spoken to the school about the incident but was allegedly told that staff couldn't intervene because it was an online issue. Melin then drastically took matters into her own hands. She drove Jade to the school and confronted a group of which her alleged bully was also a part. A number of outlets wrote that the mother then encouraged Jade to fight the other 12-year-old. However, it was also reported that Jade didn't want to take part in the altercation, so a friend of hers took on the bully instead. The police didn't confirm the relationship between 32-year-old Melin and the pre-teens in the brawl. As the two girls began fighting with Melin egging them on, another girl reportedly told the woman something along the lines of, You are a mother. You should be stopping this. It wasn't clear if the onlooker was connected to Jade's bully. Melin then spat and cursed at the child prior to grabbing her hair and attempting to knee her in the head. After the video surfaced, the mother turned herself in and was charged with three counts of endangering the welfare of a child and one count of attempted assault. Number 4. Tara Avon in April of 2019, a concerned woman from Prescott, Arizona, reported to the authorities that a long time had passed since she'd seen her neighbor, 74-year-old Sandra Avon. The latter's daughter and granddaughter lived in a property adjacent to hers and gave conflicting reports regarding Sandra's whereabouts upon being interviewed by the police. Tara and Briar Avon, aged 46 and 24 respectively, would eventually be revealed to have been involved in the matriarch's death. Her remains were found in the back bedroom of her home in a decomposed state, with duct tape around her wrists and ankles. The cause of death was determined to have been blunt force trauma. Briar would confess to hitting her grandmother multiple times in the head with a hammer and then hiding her body after she'd succumbed to her injuries. Tara learned about the killing but, instead of urging her daughter to surrender or report the incident, actively participated in covering it up. For years, both women collected Sandra's mail, bank statements and rent checks and then spent the funds. Briar pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, among other charges, and was sentenced to 38 years in prison, while Tara admitted guilt to hindering prosecution, tampering with evidence as well as charges of theft and forgery, for which she was given a sentence of 16 years. Number 3. Lori Vallow In September of 2019, Tylee Ashlyn Ryan and Joshua Jackson from Rexburg, Idaho, were reported missing by relatives amidst a string of suspicious events surrounding their mother, Lori Vallow, and her new husband, Chad Daybell. The couple had a well-documented obsession with the end of times and Daybell had expressed his doomsday-related views in numerous books and podcasts. Vallow had been an obsessive fan of his leading up to the moment they'd met in the fall of 2018, after which a relationship ensued. Around the time of the children's disappearance, people connected to Vallow and Daybell died in close succession. Vallow's husband, Charles, was shot and killed by her brother, Alex Cox, in Chandler, Arizona, in June of 2019. Cox, who would later claim self-defense, had confronted Charles for allegedly abusing his sister. Evidence would indicate that Charles had grown fearful of his wife, who had become an avid follower of Daybell and his unusual belief system. It was rooted on eternal beings, reincarnation and humans split into dark and light beings, based on their following of Satan or Christ. On October the 19th, mere weeks before Lori Vallow and Daybell got married, the latter's wife, Tammy, had died. Daybell reported that she'd passed away in her sleep from natural causes. 
and declined a post-mortem or an autopsy. Messages had allegedly been exchanged between Valo and Daybell in which the latter expressed his belief that Tammy had been possessed by a spirit. Valo and Daybell were married in Hawaii in November of 2019 and continued living there, telling others that the former's daughter was dead and mentioning no other child. They offered no contribution to the ongoing investigation into the disappearance of Tylee and Joshua, an aspect which enhanced investigators' suspicions that they'd been involved. In February of 2020, Valo was arrested in Kauai and charged with desertion and non-support of her dependent children. On June the 9th, a search warrant was executed at the Idaho home of Daybell. Two sets of human remains later confirmed as Tylee and Joshua were found in a purported pet cemetery. Documents reported on by NBC News indicated Valo had been convinced by Daybell that her children were possessed and had become zombies. The couple was indicted on murder charges for Tylee, Joshua, and Tammy's deaths. A sentence hasn't been pronounced, but based on the latest updates, Valo was found incompetent to stand trial while prosecutors expressed an intention of seeking the death penalty for Daybell. Number 2. Iris Guerrero a Las Vegas mother was arrested on charges of child abuse and child endangerment in November of 2019 after a handgun was found in the backpack of her third grade son. The child immediately reported the weapon to his teacher and said he had no idea as to how it had ended up in his school bag. The police were called in. Upon investigating the scene, officers found that the firearm wasn't loaded and that there was no ammunition in the backpack. The boy's mother, 36-year-old Iris Guerrero, was contacted and admitted that the gun was hers. Guerrero told the authorities that she'd placed the gun in her son's school bag, but then got distracted and forgot about it. The man who dropped Guerrero off at the school, 30-year-old Sebastian Navaguera, had parked a Cadillac Escalade in a red zone while waiting for her. Officers approached him about the parking issue and noticed that the vehicle's registration was expired. They asked Navaguera for his license, insurance and registration, but the man told him he didn't have anything. The police then searched the SUV while awaiting a tow truck and found a handgun. They also discovered methamphetamine in the man's possession, prompting his arrest on vehicle, weapons, and drug charges. Number 1. Anne Dodge In the summer of 2017, a mother and daughter from Sarasota, Florida, were arrested for running an unlicensed erotic massage parlor out of their home. Neighbors reported that every day there were 5 to 10 cars visiting the residence of 55-year-old Anne Dodge and her daughter Jennifer, aged 30, with the occupants predominantly consisting of older men. A Backpage.com ad posted by the women advertised the supposed therapy that brought prospective clients to a whole new level of ecstasy. The authorities followed up on a tip and put together a sting operation. After giving an undercover officer a massage, Anne was arrested on two felony counts of unlicensed practice of a healthcare profession and two misdemeanor counts of operating a massage parlor without a license. The woman maintained that she was a licensed therapist as well as a religious minister who performed laying of the hands. Jennifer was arrested separately the following day after offering to perform intimate acts on an undercover officer in exchange for $200 as opposed to the $120 price tag on a simple massage. Court records indicated she had three prior convictions for soliciting. Anne and Jennifer's activities were described as being in line with those of a brothel, with the former presumed to have initiated her daughter in the practice. Number 7. Thomas Anthony Mansfield A Welsh personal trainer died in 2021 after miscalculating the dosage of pre-workout caffeine supplement. An inquiry into the incident reached a conclusion on March the 1st of 2022 and it revealed the 29-year-old Thomas Anthony Mansfield had ordered a 100-gram packet of caffeine powder from Blackburn Distribution, a UK-based sports supplement company. He prepared a drink shortly after the product's arrival. It had a recommended dosage of 60 to 300 milligrams twice a day, but the digital scale used by the personal trainer had a starting weight of 2 grams, which provided the basis for his erring calculations. Mansfield aimed for a mid-range serving but ended up taking five grams of the powder. According to his wife, Susanna, he took an initial sip before downing the remainder of the drink. Within moments, Mansfield clutched his chest and lay down on the sofa before he started frothing at the mouth. Susanna rushed to get help from their neighbors, and an ambulance was called to the Colwyn Bay address. Paramedics arrived at the scene within minutes and used a defibrillator on Mansfield, who'd gone into cardiac arrest. He was transported to his Betty Glenn Cluid, 
where resuscitation attempts were stopped at around 4 p.m. A post-mortem examination would list caffeine toxicity as the cause of death. A coroner determined that the father of two had 392 milligrams of caffeine per liter of blood, which was nearly equivalent to him having ingested 200 cups of coffee. Number six, Hamon Rayon Bugs. 44-year-old Hamon Rayon Bugs, a personal trainer from California, was arrested and charged with double homicide, following what the authorities believed had been a jealous rampage. 38-year-old Darren Parch and Wendy Miller, aged 48, were found dead at the former's Newport Beach residence on April the 21st of 2019. Both had been executed via gunshots to the head, and their lifeless bodies were discovered by Parch's roommate, Bugs, who'd played football at Arizona State College, was a bodybuilding competitor and the founder of a personal training company called Do It Again 9. He was also a convicted felon with a substantial record that included domestic battery and assault on a police officer. Bugs was already in police custody for a string of recent burglaries when he was linked to the double homicide. It was revealed that he'd been stalking his ex-girlfriend whose identity wasn't revealed after she'd broken up with him in December of the previous year. He believed that Parch, a former minor league hockey player, was dating her and targeted him at his home. Parch and Miller, who worked as the CEO of a non-profit advocacy group, were last seen leaving a bar in Laguna Beach together. Miller wasn't the woman that Bugs had been obsessively pursuing and had met Parch while out with friends on the night of her death. Her companions reported that she'd given him a ride home because they lived in the same neighborhood. They reached the address where they were gunned down by Bugs, who'd ambushed the pair, giving them no chance to defend themselves. Roughly 18 hours later, he went to a neighborhood in Irvine as he continued hunting for the man he believed was dating his ex. He committed a series of burglaries for which he was eventually arrested after the police had set up surveillance in the area. Photos of Parch were found on his cell phone, while his address and phone number had been written on a notepad discovered in his Chevrolet Camaro. Bugs was charged with double murder with special circumstances and as of April 2022, prosecutors had decided not to pursue the death penalty against him while his defense attributed his actions to the traumatic encephalopathy he developed after sustaining repeated blows to the head on the football field. Number five, Michael Howe. Michael Howe, a personal trainer from the town of Widnes, England, was jailed for almost three years in November of 2020 after a judge determined he was a considerable risk to women. 28-year-old Howe worked for clients across Merseyside with the stated goal of transforming and improving lives. Howe also had 11 past convictions for 27 offenses, many of which included assaults on former partners. In March of the same year, he was handed down a sentence of 12 weeks in prison, suspended for two years after being convicted of battery and criminal damage against an ex-girlfriend. Howe then started dating another woman but didn't disclose the relationship to the parole services as per the terms of his sentence, nor did he tell his partner about his past convictions. While at the unnamed victim's home, on the evening of June the 9th, Howe became enraged when she received a text from a former boyfriend. He kicked the woman once in each leg with enough force that she dropped to the floor. Howe then told her that she needed discipline and pushed her before leaving the home. The personal trainer returned two days later and attacked the woman once again. After accusing her of telling a friend, he was insecure. The second attack, more vicious than the one preceding it, involved Howe dragging her from the couch by her ankles, as well as hitting the victim in the face with a keyboard, grabbing her by the throat and slamming her head into a radiator. The man then threatened to kill whoever found out about the attack. He was arrested and eventually admitted to assault by beating. Assault causing actual bodily harm and breaching his suspended sentence. A judge activated his suspended sentence in full and the personal trainer was jailed for two years and eight months. Number four, Tay Francis. In an attack allegedly fueled by the mental instability associated with steroid use, a personal trainer stabbed his girlfriend to death at a hotel in Greenwich, London in July of 2020. Tay Francis had been previously jailed in 2002 for abusing a 19-year-old ex-girlfriend at Axe Point. The victim was first attacked in a train restroom before Francis, then known under his original name as Ashley Wyatt, forced her to an address in Thornton Heath, South East London, 
where he continued abusing her. Following his release and name change, he began dating 18-year-old Chloe May Loy in 2017. Francis, then aged 34, had met her as she worked at a pub near Croydon College, where she was a student. Loy would endure a five-year-long abusive relationship, during the course of which her parents pleaded with her to leave Francis, fearing he'd eventually kill her. He was at one point convicted of actual bodily harm after throwing the woman into a wheelie bin. Loy managed to secure a restraining order against him before she was eventually drawn back into the abusive relationship. Francis reportedly became paranoid about his conviction from the 2002 assault and was convinced that vigilantes were trying to kill him. He and Loy had moved house a number of times in the months leading up to the murder. On July the 4th of 2020, the couple booked into the Greenwich Holiday Inn Express. Francis called the emergency services the following morning, claiming that he'd stabbed his girlfriend in the neck. While on the phone with the operator, he sent a photo to solicitors of Loy lying dead on the bed with the message, I've killed my girlfriend. He was arrested and admitted manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, claiming his mind state was altered at the time. However, prosecutors argued that the fragility of Francis's psyche was of his own design and attributed the murder to roid rage from his decade-long practice of injecting steroids. He was eventually convicted of murder and sentenced to a minimum of 23 years in prison. Number 3. Dijon Miller Shortly before Christmas in 2011, North Hollywood personal trainer Dijon Miller was arrested for beating his girlfriend unconscious. At the time, Miller, who went by the nickname Danger, was already on parole for a previous domestic abuse charge. His latest victim, only identified as being in her late 20s, had been beaten so badly that LAPD detective Brandy Arzate reported she was really close to passing away. 35-year-old Miller ran the websites eataFit.com and sexyisback.com through which he advertised personal trainer services that were primarily directed at young women. He boasted 15 years of experience, adding that his style was professional, realistic, and a little funky at the same time. His Facebook displayed photos of a group of models deemed Danger's Angels. The authorities reported that aside from the vicious attack on his girlfriend, Miller had abused at least five other women whom he'd lured through his business enterprise, either as prospective clients or models. The man had reportedly met two of them through Craigslist and, like the others, they'd become victims of extreme physical and emotional abuse. During a press conference, the LAPD revealed that what he'd done to them resembled torture but didn't provide further details beyond Azart emphasizing they were things she'd never encountered in her career as a detective. The police believed that there were more victims of Miller's abuse in the San Fernando Valley area and encouraged them to come forward, assuring them that the personal trainer would be jailed for a long time. For the attack on his girlfriend, he was charged with attempted murder and held on a $1.3 million bail as the investigation into his horrendous criminal activity continued. Number 2. Jake Torian On March the 17th of 2020, personal trainer Jake Torian and Paul Mons were both at the Alexander's nightclub in Worcester, England. The two men were involved in a violent physical altercation that had begun with the latter, dancing in what a judge would later describe as a slightly drunk, slightly foolhardy way. In doing so, Mons bumped into Torian several times on the dance floor. The 21-year-old personal trainer, who was successful in his field and reportedly earned over $10,000 a month, flew into a fit of rage. He attacked Mons with three rapid-fire punches, ending the barrage with a vicious uppercut that knocked the other man unconscious. Mons came to and staggered out of the club before taking a taxi to Worcestershire Royal Hospital. He suffered temporary amnesia as a result of the attack which left him needing dental work as well as with bruising to his eye and severe swelling to the right side of his face. He told police officers that he felt like his jaw was hanging off and it was reported that in the period following the beating, he had nightmares about being assaulted. Torian maintained he'd acted in self-defense but was found guilty of assault, occasioning actual bodily harm. He was given a sentence of eight months, suspended for two years in order to pay the victim over $3,000. Number 1. Greg Plitt After spending five years as a ranger in the US Army, 
Greg Plitt began a successful career as a personal trainer and fitness model. He became associated with the MetRx nutritional supplement brand and, in 2012, was named its Athlete of the Year. The work he'd done training military recruits inspired his approach as a personal trainer, and he authored the MFT28 workout program, which was featured in numerous high-profile fitness publications. Plitt, who'd also appeared on the Bravo reality TV series Workout, rose to the top of the fitness industry. He received widespread acclaim for his physique, which led to him appearing in numerous commercials, becoming a spokesperson for several men's fragrances and modeling for brands that included Calvin Klein, Old Navy, and Under Armour. On January the 17th of 2015, Plitt was recording a video that was reportedly part of a self-produced energy drink commercial. He was running between the rails of the Metrolink Antelope Valley Line in Burbank, California. A recorder camera mounted in the cab of train 268's lead locomotive recorded the horrific incident that followed. Plitt, who'd been running dressed in all black and carrying a camcorder, was knocked off the track and out of frame as he was struck by a southbound train. He was killed instantly. The police would later tell TMZ that as part of the commercial, Plitt appeared to be trying to outrun the train. He was mourned by many in the fitness industry, and one theory that emerged in the aftermath of his death proposed he may have believed the train was coming up behind him on a parallel track, not the one on which he was. Number 7. Kanaya Alvarez Flores At about 8 a.m. on April the 8th of 2018, Nebraska resident Melissa Camargo Flores stabbed Kanaya Alvarez Flores multiple times outside her home in Sioux City, Iowa. An eyewitness followed Camargo Flores from the scene of the crime and was therefore able to provide the authorities with a description of the car she was driving. The woman was then tracked down by local law enforcement about a mile from the crime scene. Alvarez Flores was taken to a nearby hospital where she was pronounced dead a short time later. Officers reportedly found blood-stained gloves and a bloody knife inside Camargo Flores' vehicle. Upon being questioned by detectives, the 20-year-old confessed to have waited outside the victim's house until she left for work, at which point she confronted and attacked her. It subsequently emerged that the two women had been in a love rivalry that centered on Alvarez Flores' fiancé, Lalo Perez. Camargo Flores also claimed to have been in a romantic relationship with the latter, although her report wasn't officially confirmed. The police clarified that there was no familial tie between Alvarez Flores and Camargo Flores, but the two women have reportedly experienced multiple issues with one another in the years leading up to the fatal altercation. In October of 2020, Camargo Flores pleaded guilty to a charge of second-degree murder. In December of that same year, she was sentenced to 50 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after 35 years. Number 6. Wilfred Isaac Sr. A feud lasting several years between members of two traveler families from the UK culminated in a violent altercation at the Chubbards Cross caravan site near Ilminster, Somerset. On May the 5th of 2016, the incident unfolded after Wilfred Isaac Sr. and his son had become embroiled in a verbal dispute with three members of the rival Broadway family, named as 24-year-old Charlie and his brothers John and Billy. It was later detailed how as tensions between the two parties escalated, one of the Broadway struck Isaacs in the head with a metal bar, prompting his son to step in to defend him. Then Charlie Broadway allegedly struck the younger man in the face, before firing a double-barreled pump-action shotgun at his father from point-blank range. Following the shooting, which resulted in 49-year-old Isaacs' death, Charlie and John fled the scene, prompting the authorities to launch a nationwide manhunt. Charlie ultimately turned himself in at the Bridgewater Police Center the following day, while John was located in Litchfield, Staffordshire, on May the 7th. During the ensuing investigation, the police found several illegally owned firearms and ammunition at the caravan site, where the confrontation between the families had taken place. Following a trial at Bristol Crown Court, Charlie was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 34 years, while his brothers, John and Billy, were sentenced to 15 and 12 years, respectively, for their roles in Isaacs' murder. Number 5. Matthew Bodoin in the early hours of May the 1st of 2008, New Hampshire woman Yvonne Hernandez 
got into an argument with four individuals who taunted her for being a fan of the Major League Baseball franchise, the New York Yankees. Subsequent reports revealed how during a heated conversation with Matthew Bodoin and three of his friends, Hernandez had boasted about how the Yankees had won more World Series championships than their rivals, the Boston Red Sox. The 46-year-old woman later testified in court that following her comment, the group of rival supporters had begun pounding on the hood of her car, which reportedly bore a Yankees bumper sticker. Investigators gathered from eyewitnesses, however, that Hernandez had driven away from Bodoin and the others before turning around, revving her engine and plowing directly into them with her vehicle. Bodoin was critically injured in the collision and ultimately passed away at the hospital a few hours later. In the incident's aftermath, it emerged that Hernandez had spent the previous night drinking at various bars before her running with Bodoin's group. Her blood alcohol content was determined to have been twice the state's legal driving limit at the time of the deadly crash. In 2009, Hernandez was convicted of second-degree murder and consequently sentenced to 20 to 40 years behind bars. Number 4. Michael Brock A 19-year-old Louisiana rapper was gunned down at an acquaintance's residence in the Sunset Acres housing complex in Bogalusa on June the 7th of 2021. Local authorities later revealed that the victim, Michael Brock, along with other members of the Tangipahoa Parish-based rap group 313, had been hiding out at the apartment after being threatened on social media by a rival group. A few days later, the police identified Torge Charles Taplin and Quadavian Tyvon White as suspects in Brock's fatal shooting. The two teenagers were reported as members of a local rap group known as The Force, which had been involved in a heated rivalry with 313. White, who allegedly served as the getaway driver in the targeted shooting, was also connected to the notorious Chicago gang, Gangster Disciples. The Bogalusa Police Department collaborated with several other agencies, including the Louisiana State Police and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, in their effort to track down Taplin and White. The two teenage suspects were eventually located near Houston, Texas, and they subsequently led pursuing officers on a high-speed chase towards Beaumont. Both were eventually taken into police custody, whereupon they were formally charged in connection to their rival's murder. Number 3. Jason Isaacs During a night out with friends in November of 2017, Jason Isaacs was aggressively chased through the streets of North Holt, West London, by a group of four individuals wearing balaclava masks and riding mopeds. Upon catching up with the 18-year-old, one of the masked pursuers stabbed him multiple times with a large knife. The assailant subsequently fled the scene while a severely injured Isaac staggered into a nearby residence garden and pleaded for help. He was rushed to the hospital where doctors performed a thoracotomy, a surgical procedure that involves making a large incision between a patient's ribs in order to gain access to organs in the chest. In spite of the medical staff's efforts, Isaacs ultimately succumbed to the knife injuries. Following an investigation, local police determined that the attack had been perpetrated by members of a gang from Harrow. 19-year-old Joel Amade, who was out on bond at the time, was identified as the individual who'd fatally knifed the teenager. The police revealed that a maid's gang had an established rivalry with a gang from North Holt, with which Isaacs had been associated. Following a trial at the Old Bailey, a maid was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 20 years. Number 2. Kisha Johnson Nursing student Kisha Johnson and her younger sister, Safi Smith, were at their mother's home in Fort Worth, Texas on the night of May the 30th of 2019. Johnson had reportedly been telling her mother Darlene Brown about her academic accomplishments during her most recent semester at university. Brown later told investigators that Smith, who was struggling with drug addiction and other personal issues at the time, overheard the conversation and became jealous of her sister. Although Brown claimed that Smith had long been envious of her sister's accomplishments, their sibling rivalry erupted into a violent confrontation that evening. Fueled by jealous rage, Smith allegedly threw an unidentified object at Johnson, prompting their mother to ask that she leave the house. Johnson then followed Smith to her car in order to record her license plate, and their dispute continued outside, as was later confirmed to the police by multiple neighbors and Brown herself. Smith got into her car and proceeded to drive directly into her sister, dragging her into the middle of a nearby intersection. She then reversed and ran Johnson over several more times before leaving the scene. The victim was taken to the hospital where she was immediately placed in the intensive care unit. She had reportedly sustained a number of critical injuries including cracked ribs, a broken pelvis, 
and a collapsed lung. In an interview with local news stations, Johnson's husband revealed that in addition to severe pain, she was having great difficulty breathing. Nearly a month following the incident, Johnson was released from the hospital and began her recovery process at home. Smith was ultimately arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Johnson publicly stated that she believed her sister should be punished for her harmful behavior, which had caused her to put her nursing studies temporarily on hold. Number 1. Sophie Taylor 23-year-old Welsh woman Melissa Pastikia had been in a long-term romantic relationship with Michael Wheeler and in the summer of 2016 was living with him at his parents' home. It was around that time that 22-year-old Wheeler reportedly began talking to another woman, later identified as Sophie Taylor, also 22. The man eventually ended his relationship with Pesticchio in order to pursue Taylor, a decision that resulted in considerable friction between the two women, who began exchanging expletive-laced insults on social media on a regular basis. In August of 2016, Wheeler and Taylor broke up and the former then got back together with Pesticchio. Taylor subsequently approached the couple and demanded her money back from a motorcycle she had allegedly bought Wheeler shortly before the end of their relationship. The couple refused to give the young woman any money and, in what was reported as an attempt to intimidate Taylor, they then proceeded to follow her around town and shout abuse at her. Court documents detailed how the contentious love rivalry came to a tragic conclusion in the early morning hours of August the 22nd. On that day, Wheeler and Pesticchio began tailing Taylor's black BMW in separate cars. A high-speed pursuit, sequences of which were captured by traffic cameras, then ensued on the streets of Cardiff. Taylor was ultimately killed, following what was characterized as a Fast and Furious-style car chase. After colliding with Wheeler's vehicle and careening into a nearby building, in the wake of the incident, both Wheeler and Pesticchio were arrested and charged with causing death by dangerous driving. Upon being convicted of the offense, they were consequently jailed for six and a half years each. Number 8. Adrian Alvarez on the morning of August the 1st of 2013, Doña Ana County Police received a call about a domestic dispute at a home in Santa Teresa, New Mexico. The officers sent to investigate determined that Adrian Alvarez, aged 28, had been involved in a physical altercation with her husband, Azael. She had allegedly acted as the primary aggressor in the row. The woman had risen to local prominence as an accomplished journalist and anchor for the NBC affiliate station KTSM in El Paso, Texas. She'd won multiple awards for her reporting, including an Emmy in 2009. Following the incident in question, Alvarez was taken into police custody and booked into the county detention center. She was later released on a $1,000 bail. In the immediate aftermath of Alvarez's arrest, the general manager of KTSM released a statement confirming that he was aware of the anchor's situation, but claimed that he'd wait for more details before making any further comments. The El Paso ABC affiliate KVIA became the subject of criticism in relation to their coverage of Alvarez's arrest. The rival station reportedly sent a news crew to the anchor's house in an attempt to get a statement from her regarding the domestic violence incident. A writer for the El Paso Times questioned whether KVIA had been too aggressive in its reporting of the situation and many viewers expressed their disapproval of the station's coverage on social media. In January of 2015, Alvarez publicly stated that she was no longer working for KTSM. Number 7. Felicia Taylor the former host of the CNN international program World Business Today was arrested in September of 2015 after she'd sideswiped a parked car in Southampton, New York, while under the influence of alcohol. The accident reportedly occurred in the village of Sag Harbor during the late afternoon of September the 4th. The officers who'd arrived at the scene noted that the vehicle's driver, 51-year-old Felicia Taylor, appeared to be acutely intoxicated. She was consequently taken to a nearby hospital to undergo a medical evaluation. A report by the New York Post later detailed detailed how Taylor's blood alcohol level had allegedly been three times the legal driving limit at the time of the incident. She was arrested at the hospital and charged with aggravated DWI. Number 6. Omar Jimenez On May the 29th of 2020, CNN News correspondent Omar Jimenez was arrested while reporting on the protests organized in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Shortly after 5 a.m., a pair of Minnesota state police officers approached Jimenez and his three-person news crew while they were reporting live on the New Day morning news program. The officers reportedly requested that the crew move back from the place where they'd been set up. Jimenez agreed to do so and asked what other spot would be more suitable, but the officers walked away before giving an answer. A few minutes later, as Jimenez continued to report from the same area, a group of police officers surrounded him 
and his crew and took them into custody. They were detained at a local precinct for about an hour, at which point they were verified as members of the media and granted release. Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz issued a formal apology to Jimenez and CNN for what he described as an unacceptable mistake on the police's part. Number 5. Bree Walker In the early morning hours of February the 19th of 2014, Veteran TV news anchor Bree Walker was arrested in Orange County, California, on suspicion of driving under the influence of alcohol. The former CBS reporter had previously risen to national recognition after becoming the first on-air television news anchor in the US with ectrodactyly. The rare genetic condition causes one's fingers and toes to be fused together. Over the course of her career, Walker worked as a radio host and TV reporter for various news stations in San Diego, Los Angeles, and New York. The 61-year-old had been pulled over by police on the night of her arrest after she'd failed to stop at a red light. The officers at the scene described Walker as appearing disheveled and smelling strongly of alcohol. The former news anchor failed a field sobriety test, refused to submit to a breathalyzer, and was allegedly unable to provide the officers with a valid driver's license. She was consequently charged with a misdemeanor DUI before being released from custody a few hours later. Walker had reportedly checked herself into a rehabilitation facility for alcohol abuse in February of 2007. After roughly five years of sobriety, she allegedly began drinking again in December of 2012. According to witnesses who'd spotted her at the Rooster Fish Bar, which was located near her home in Venice, California. Number 4. Chris Nakamoto on March the 23rd of 2016, a news reporter was handcuffed and detained by police in the small town of White Castle, Louisiana. Subsequent reports indicated that Chris Nakamoto, the chief investigative journalist for the local ABC affiliate WBRZ, had visited City Hall to follow up on a public records request he'd made earlier in the week. Nakamoto had reportedly been investigating an unexplained pay raise that had recently been given to the town's mayor. but. Not all of the documents he'd requested were provided to him. After a town official had refused to oblige the reporter's request for the missing records, a White Castle police officer stationed at City Hall reportedly asked him to leave the building. Nakamoto claimed he was under no obligation to conform to the officer's orders as he was in a public area and hadn't done anything illegal. At that point, the officer put the reporter in handcuffs and escorted him out of the building. He was subsequently taken to the local police station and issued a misdemeanor summons for trespassing. Nakamoto's boss defended his actions and said that he'd been doing his job in trying to hold public officials accountable. The case against him was ultimately dropped by the town's attorney, Valencia Vessel Landry, three weeks after the reporter's initial arrest. Number 2. Danielle Miskell Shortly before 10 p.m. on May the 13th of 2021, police officers in Waterloo, Iowa, were dispatched to an apartment building after receiving reports of a domestic disturbance. Upon their arrival, they discovered that 34-year-old Danielle Miskell, a weekend news reporter for KWWL-TV, had been involved in a physical altercation with her boyfriend, William Moore. A neighbor and tenant told the officers that they'd witnessed Moore leave the apartment while holding an ice pack to his face, which was noticeably swollen. It emerged that Miskell had punched and kicked the man several times after the two had gotten into a heated argument earlier in the night. Iowa law stipulates that during a domestic violence call, the police must arrest one of the parties involved if an injury has been inflicted. Miskell was thus taken into custody in spite of her claims that she'd been acting in self-defense when she struck her boyfriend. She was charged with misdemeanor domestic assault with injury. Following her arrest, Miskell filed a restraining order against Moore, alleging that he'd put her in a chokehold and slammed her body to the floor during the incident in question. She was ultimately found not guilty of the assault charges in August of 2021. Miskell's final television appearance for KWWL-TV occurred during the weekend immediately following the altercation. Once news of her arrest had been made public, the station decided to take her off the air, but she reportedly remained under their employment. Shortly thereafter, they parted ways with Miss Skell entirely, but maintained the separation had been for reasons unrelated to her arrest. Number 1. Farron Sally The morning and weekend news anchor for West Palm Beach's Channel 25 in Florida was arrested for driving under the influence on December the 15th of 2018. 
After she'd been pulled over by the police, 28-year-old Farron Sally was asked to take a field sobriety test, which she reportedly failed. In the resulting arrest report, Cameron Carver, one of the officers at the scene, claimed to have detected the smell of alcohol on the woman's breath. He also noted that her eyes were bloodshot and her pupils dilated. After failing the field test, Sally was taken into custody and charged with a DUI. Court records detailed how she'd later told the officers at the county jail that she suffered from borderline personality disorder and was taking medication that she couldn't identify. The Palm Beach County State Attorney ultimately dropped the charges against the news anchor, stating that there wasn't enough evidence to convict her. Following her acquittal, Sally returned to work at Channel 25 after a two-month leave of absence. She publicly professed her innocence in relation to the DUI but did, however, admit to consuming a single alcoholic beverage with dinner three hours before the traffic stop had been initiated that night. Footage from the arresting officer's body cams was later obtained by the UK news website Daily Mail. During the hour-long video, Sally slurred her speech as she accused the officers of targeting her because of her race. Among other belligerent remarks, the reporter at one point made fun of Officer Carver's male pattern baldness and belittled his intelligence. Sally publicly apologized for her behavior towards the Palm Beach officers, but maintained that she had not been intoxicated on the evening of her arrest. Number 6. Ibn Collins In the early hours of January the 20th of 2019, a mechanic mowed down a woman in Linden, New Jersey, and subsequently spent several months quietly trying to cover his tracks. 35-year-old elementary school teacher Megan Crilly and a few of her friends were crossing an intersection in the area of St. George's Avenue after a night out at a local bar. 39-year-old Ibn Collins had been celebrating his birthday and was allegedly intoxicated. While behind the wheel of his 2015 Jeep Grand Cherokee, he ran a red light and then plowed into Crilly. The force of the impact reportedly launched the school teacher an estimated 140 feet, which is nearly the width of a football field. Collins didn't stop or slow down and continued driving through the intersection. Crilly was taken to University Hospital in Newark after having sustained shattered bones, spinal cord injuries, and a lacerated liver, resulting in massive internal bleeding. She died in the hospital 11 days later. Following the collision, Collins drove back to the auto shop where he worked in Westfield and hid the Grand Cherokee. According to the authorities, he'd explained the damage to his shop's owner as him having hit a deer and spent the next two months ordering parts to fix the car. The Grand Cherokee's battered bumper, a key piece of evidence, was traced to a salvage yard in Pensorkin, roughly 70 miles from the scene of the accident. Collins was subsequently arrested and charged with aggravated manslaughter and death by auto while intoxicated, both first-degree crimes, as well as hindering apprehension and tampering with evidence. Number 5. Cody Haynes A mechanic, whose line of work included maintaining the White House's helicopter fleet, was arrested at his home in Port St. Lucie, Florida in October of 2018. Cody Haynes, who reportedly had top-secret security clearance because of his position, had placed a frantic 911 call claiming that armed intruders were holding his family hostage. Several officers were dispatched to his home. Upon their arrival, 30-year-old Haynes told them that three masked African-American subjects had held his family captive for hours. He claimed to have escaped with his daughter but believed the intruders had remained inside with his girlfriend, Tara Frew. The police found no evidence of a break-in but noticed that Haynes had dilated pupils, was sweating profusely, and his breathing was labored. Inside a box in the master bedroom, officers discovered a white substance, later confirmed as methamphetamine, as well as drug paraphernalia. When they asked him to pull up Fru's number on his cell phone, they noticed a website about drug hallucinations on Haynes' browser. He ultimately admitted that he'd been smoking meth, and Fru confirmed that he'd been using the drug, allegedly to deal with anxiety upon being contacted by the officers. The helicopter mechanic was arrested and charged with child neglect and drug possession. Number 4. Benjamin Hunt and Jonathan Hassel Two mechanics from Longton, England, killed a man while carrying out a citizen's arrest on May the 15th of 2019. Benjamin Hunt, then in his early 30s, and his colleague Jonathan Hassel were at work when a man with a sledgehammer walked up to an Audi belonging to the latter's son. It's unclear what had driven the man, identified as 25-year-old Christopher Walters, to then smash the vehicle's windows. The two mechanics chased him down and managed to immobilize him. Hassel was reportedly pinning down his lower body while Hunt held Walters around the neck. 
He was resisting them and the mechanics were allegedly afraid to release him for fear of what he might do to them or others. At some point, however, Walters stopped trying to fight back and even though Hunt believed him to be unconscious, he kept using his body weight to apply pressure to his neck. The police were called and arrived roughly 19 minutes after the man had been detained to find Hunt still on top of him. Walters died and a post-mortem revealed significant bruising to his neck as well as oxygen deprivation in his brain. Compression of the neck was pronounced as the cause of death, resulting in both Hunt and Hassel being charged with manslaughter. The latter only days before his trial was due to commence. Hunt pleaded guilty and was given 38 months in jail, a sentence which the victim's mother described as a joke. Number 3. Francisco Rogero Leandro Ramos a Brazilian mechanic was carjacked and held at gunpoint in October of 2021 after taking a customer's luxury car for a joyride. Francisco Rogero Leandro Ramos had been working on a Porsche valued at close to $90,000 at a shop in Rio de Janeiro. It belonged to an unnamed businessman from the city of Nova Iguaçu who wanted the vehicle's stereo fixed. On October the 24th, Ramos had decided to take his girlfriend for a ride in the Porsche and the couple were traveling through the neighborhood of California. CCTV would show that after turning right off a main road, Ramos was forced to slow down as another vehicle was blocking his path. The second car then drove off but before the mechanic could do the same, two men approached the Porsche with their guns drawn. Surveillance cameras captured the moment Ramos and his girlfriend were forced out of the high-end car. Believing the mechanic to be the vehicle's wealthy owner, the robbers ordered him to get in the back seat and then drove to a cash point. He tried telling them that the Porsche didn't belong to him, an aspect that the robbers only believed after his bank account was revealed to be empty. They then drove to the city of Nilopolis, where they abandoned Ramos and the car without taking anything. The police launched an investigation, but the legal implications Ramos was to face for the ill-fated joyride remained unspecified. Number 2. Colin Gale in the early afternoon of April the 19th of 2014, Mark Manning met with Colin Gale at the latter's garage, P&B Motors in Western Road, Worthing, England. 54-year-old Manning was a bomb disposal expert who'd worked for Princess Diana's anti-landmine charity. Three days after the meetup with Gale, Manning was reported missing by his son. As the last person to have seen him, Gale was interviewed by the police. He maintained that he dropped Manning off at the Worthing station, but his story was later found to lack credibility as the man hadn't appeared in any surveillance footage. Gale's then-wife subsequently told the investigators that he'd confessed to her to have killed Manning and then enlisted the help of friend Stuart Robertson to dispose of the body. The motive had reportedly been a sum of over $23,000 owed to Manning by Gale from the sale of two vehicles. Following his arrest on suspicion of murder in May of 2015 and during his ensuing trial, Gale's defense would try to claim that the six foot eight inch man had had a serious fear of violence from Manning because of the debt. Moments before he was killed, the latter had reportedly showed up at the garage and swung an axe at Gale. The mechanic grabbed an industrial wrench, which was over three feet long, and bludgeoned him to death with it. He then allegedly told his wife, I finished him off. The self defense angle ultimately didn't hold up in court, and Gale was convicted of manslaughter by loss of control and sentenced to over 15 years in prison. Robertson was also arrested and revealed the location of the body, which he dumped in dense undergrowth in Hampshire Hill in March of 2016. He was sentenced to four years for preventing a lawful burial. Number 1. Peter Madsen In 2017, Swedish-born journalist Kim Wall was living in Copenhagen, Denmark, with her boyfriend, Ole Stobe. Earlier in the year, she'd asked for an interview with engineer Peter Madsen, who'd earned a reputation as a brilliant mechanic and inventor. In August, he invited her on his privately built UC-3 Nautilus submarine. She boarded it on the 10th from Korea Bay at around 7 p.m. for what was expected to be a two-hour interview. At 8.30, a passing ship captured a photo of Madsen and Wall, the submarine's sole occupants, in the watercraft's control tower. Wall didn't return to the drop-off point and was never seen alive again. Stobe had failed to reach her and called the police early on the 11th to report her missing. A few hours later, the Nautilus foundered in Cog Bay, south of Copenhagen, and Madsen was rescued from the water. There was no sign of wall. The mechanic maintained that he disembarked the journalist at Refshaloen 
and then experienced a technical problem that led to his submarine sinking. The authorities, however, found that the Nautilus had been scuttled and a series of gruesome revelations followed. On August the 21st, a dismembered torso was found on a beach southwest of Amaga with 15 stab wounds, some in the groin region. The remains were confirmed as walls via DNA testing. On October the 6th, divers discovered two plastic bags in Clear Bay containing Wall's head, legs, clothes, and a knife, while her arms were found in late November. Madsen had changed his story on August the 12th and stated that the woman died after he'd accidentally slammed the submarine's hatch into her head. However, her subsequently discovered skull showed no evidence of blunt force trauma. Madsen gave yet another account of the event, still denying he'd murdered Wall, but admitting to the dismemberment and inviting speculation that she'd succumbed to carbon monoxide inhalation. The prosecution would argue that he'd abused, tortured and then strangled Wall or slit her throat prior to cutting up her body and then scuttling the Nautilus to cover his tracks. Madsen, whose psychiatric evaluation established him as a narcissistic psychopath, was found guilty of murder and ultimately sentenced to life in prison in 2018. Two years later, in October, he made a short-lived escape by holding a female psychologist hostage with a pistol-like contraption and then hijacking a van. He was also wearing a belt seemingly rigged with explosives, but that was later determined to have been a decoy. He was apprehended less than 550 yards from the prison. Number 9. Vancouver Stanley Cup Riot The Boston Bruins defeated the Vancouver Canucks in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals, played in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia, on June the 15th of 2011. City organizers had set up a two-block-long fan zone on Georgia Street near the Rogers Arena, where a crowd of tens of thousands had gathered. After the ice hockey game's conclusion, several supporters started throwing bottles and other objects at the large screens in the viewing area. Others began burning Boston Bruins flags and Canucks jerseys. A group of fans who'd been heard chanting, Let's go riot! since the first period, then overturned a vehicle in front of the main post office, which was later set on fire along with 16 others, including police cars. Various businesses in the area were vandalized by fans as law enforcement kept pushing them further away from the fan zone in an attempt to break off the riot. Multiple stores were left with broken windows and several hundred theatergoers were trapped inside Queen Elizabeth Theatre, where they'd remained for their safety. One man was taken to the hospital in critical condition after he'd attempted to jump from Georgia Viaduct onto another platform and fallen. At least 140 people, including several police officers, were injured and four stabbings had reportedly occurred. 101 arrests were made in the immediate aftermath, 85 of them for breach of peace, 8 for public intoxication and another 8 for breaking and entering theft or assault. The investigation into the incident lasted for four years and in 2015, a total of 887 charges were laid against 301 people. Number 8. Terry Lee Corsi On February the 23rd of 2018, during a little league practice at the Orange Park Athletic Association baseball fields in Florida, a woman was attacked by 37-year-old high school teacher Terry Lee Corsi. The victim had been watching her child on the field when the teacher, who was also there to support her own child, allegedly criticized her for wearing short shorts to the practice. According to the victim's report, Corsi not only berated her, but tackled and punched her in the face. The mother was left with visible bruises on her forearms, a cut on her right wrist and abrasions on her elbow, shoulder and chest. Corsi was detained the next day and she was also suspended from Clay High following her arrest. Court records reveal the teacher pleaded not guilty to a first-degree misdemeanor charge of simple battery. Number 7. Paola Garcia on June the 23rd of 2019, the Los Angeles Dodgers were playing against the Colorado Rockies in Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, California. During the ninth inning, the crowd started cheering loudly as a teenager from the Tribunes was seen entering the field and running towards Cody Bellinger, who'd been having a prolific season for the Dodgers. The team was later identified as Paola Garcia and had reportedly seized the opportunity to sprint towards Bellinger, her favorite player, 
while her mother was using the restroom. When Garcia reached Bellinger, who was visibly confused, she managed to give him a hug before being tackled by security agents and taken out of the field. Following the game, Bellinger stated in an interview that he'd asked the fan if she knew she was going to jail for the incident, to which Garcia had allegedly replied, it was worth it. The teenager was arrested on the spot but wasn't reported to have faced any serious legal consequences for her actions. Number 6. Heinz Field Altercation On August the 21st of 2021, the Pittsburgh Steelers football team played a preseason game with the Detroit Lions at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. During the game, a heated argument broke out in the tribunes between a male and a female supporter. In a video captured and subsequently shared by a witness to the escalating conflict, the female fan was seen yelling at the man and then trying to punch him. The latter seemingly caught her fist and then proceeded to warn her not to touch him. The woman nevertheless immediately slapped him, sparking a physical altercation. The man who'd been sitting next to the female fan then stood up and intervened in the brawl, trying to prevent the other man from responding with strikes of his own. He, however, ended up on the receiving end of several punches and was briefly knocked unconscious. Eventually, bystanders intervened, breaking up the brawl and separating the trio. After the video went viral, Pittsburgh police launched an investigation and cited a woman involved identified as the bout's main aggressor for disorderly conduct. Number 5. Samantha Lynn On August the 31st of 2013, during a football game between Northern Illinois and Iowa held at Kinnick Stadium, a female supporter leaped over a barrier and tried to run onto the field. Security managed to stop her from interfering with the game and she was arrested. Identified as Samantha Lynn Goody, aged 22, the woman had live-streamed the whole incident on her Twitter page. According to a police report, officers had noticed she was unsteady on her feet, so the woman was made to take a breathalyzer. Goody was subsequently charged with public intoxication after she was found to have an alcohol concentration of 0.341 in her blood more than four times over the drink driving limit. Goody boasted about her breathalyzer results on her social media and joked about getting the number tattooed on her body. She was eventually bailed out of jail by her mother. Following her live detailing of the incident on Twitter, Goody received a plethora of negative comments and ended up deleting her account. Number 4. Charlie Perry On July the 11th of 2021, England faced Italy in the Euro 2020 final in a match played at Wembley Stadium in London. After the match ended, supporters took to the streets and footage emerged of a young man who'd appeared to be taking cocaine before putting a flare up his backside. He was later named as 25-year-old Charlie Perry, who claimed to have drunk 20 cans of cider and partaken in drugs before attending the game. The self-described Chelsea fan was reported to have entered the stadium without a ticket. He dodged security along with other gate crashes and subsequently told media outlets he wasn't remorseful about his actions. Initially, he'd been stopped and thrown out, but he later returned without his distinctive bucket hat and bribed a steward. Minutes after the match had ended, Perry exited the stadium and while in the street, he was reportedly urged by onlookers to place a flaming firework between his buttocks. He proceeded to do the stunt, which he later called reckless, and claimed to have not felt pain from the flames due to being severely intoxicated. As his stunt went viral online, some were amused by Perry's antics, while many others criticized him as being a poor reflection of sports supporters in England. Number 3. Guaranteed Rate Field Brawl On July the 6th of 2019, the White Sox baseball team won an MLB game against the Chicago Cubs played at the Guaranteed Rate Field in Chicago, Illinois. At one point during the game, a fight erupted in the tribunes, mainly between female supporters. Several fans were seen hitting each other in the face, pulling here, with one woman lashing out at another supporter who tried to stop her from attacking a male fan. The incident continued for several minutes before security managed to break it off. Another incident between two male supporters of the two teams was filmed in the concourse. They were seen fist-fighting and wrestling each other before being split by bystanders, and it's unclear what other reasons beyond tensions from the sports rivalry had led to the brawl. Police reportedly made no arrests in connection with the melee. Number 2. Otavio Jordao da Silva Cantanede on June the 30th of 2013, Otavio Jordao da Silva Cantanede, aged 20, was participating in an amateur soccer match in, in Pioche, Maranao, Brazil. 
After injuring his ankle during the first half of the game, Silva was moved to referee for the second half. In his new capacity, he made a call to send off 30-year-old Yosemar Dos Santos Ebru from the game. In response, the aggrieved player went to argue with him and ended up punching De Silva. The latter then pulled a knife from his pocket and stabbed Abru twice, inflicting injuries that required urgent medical attention. Abru was taken to the hospital but died on the way. Players and fans were enraged at the news of Abru's death and invaded the pitch, attacking Silva. The referee was restrained, stoned, beaten and stabbed to death. Both of his legs were severed, while his right arm and left wrist were left attached to his body only by strips of flesh. The mob concluded their onslaught by decapitating Silver and impaling his head on a wooden spike. Police started an investigation but were unable to identify the exact wound that had caused the 20-year-old's death. In July of 2013, only one person was arrested in connection to his gruesome murder. Number 1. Port Said Stadium Riot an Egyptian Premier League football match took place between the Masri and Ali teams at the Port Said Stadium in Egypt on February 1st of 2012. The match started 30 minutes past schedule, delayed by Masri fans who were on the pitch. They repeated their playing field invasion during half-time as tensions began to escalate. After Masri won with a 3-1 score against their rivals, the team supporters stormed the stadium stands and the pitch once more, attacking the Ali fans with clubs, stones, bottles and fireworks. In the pandemonium, the latter team's coach, Manuel Jose, also encountered the aggressive supporters while attempting to return to his locker room and ended up being kicked and punched. The losing team's fans were trapped inside the Ali, partition of the stadium as the police had reportedly refused to open the stadium gates. A stampede ensued and dozens were trampled. In the end, 74 people were killed and hundreds of others were injured. Following the violent event, riots erupted in multiple cities around the country and severe clashes continued until February the 11th. The civil unrest ended two days later and 73 defendants, including nine police officers and two officials from Port Said's Masri Club, were charged in the aftermath. As of November the 15th of 2015, a number of them were acquitted, including seven police officers and one Masri Club official. Of the remaining defendants, 11 were sentenced to death 10 received 15-year-long prison terms and 26 others were given prison sentences of varying lengths. Number 8. Marie Crabtree A woman from Gold Coast, Australia, faced criminal charges in connection to the suspicious deaths of her teenage daughter and adult son, which had occurred in 2012 and 2017 respectively. The mother, alleged to have been involved in her children's killings, was Marie Crabtree, whose atrocious actions were described extensively during a committal hearing at Brisbane Magistrates Court in March of 2021. Crabtree, who had reportedly been charged with murder, attempted murder, torture and fraud, was accused of repeatedly giving her children various prescription drugs that proved detrimental to their health and development. She'd allegedly given her son Jonathan, who was 26 at the time of his passing, smoothies laced with opioids on more than one occasion. An unidentified woman who claimed to have witnessed Crabtree's crimes firsthand told the court that the mother had administered dangerously high doses of pain medication that ultimately resulted in both of her children's deaths. The female witness reportedly served as a lookout while Crabtree concocted Jonathan's lethal smoothie and she later recounted in court how she'd listened to the man make pained noises for nine hours as he overdosed. It was initially thought that both Jonathan and his sister Erin was ultimately identified as the culprit. Number 7. Erin Garcia in September of 2021, an eight-year-old girl was dragged alongside a move-in vehicle for 300 feet as she attempted to stop her inebriated mother from driving. According to law enforcement in Placentia, California, Erin Garcia, aged 44, had gotten behind the wheel of her SUV in defiance of her concerned daughter's protest that she was too drunk to drive. At about 11.30 p.m., Garcia's daughter clutched the handle to the passenger side door to keep her mother from driving away. A male bystander also reportedly grabbed onto the vehicle, but Garcia accelerated nonetheless, pulling the man and her young daughter down the road for a distance nearly equivalent to the length of a football field. Police officers descended on Garcia's residence a short while later 
at which point they found the intoxicated suspect hiding behind some bushes in the backyard. The woman allegedly kicked the officers as they attempted to take her into custody, but she was eventually brought to the station without further incident. Garcia ultimately faced charges of assault with a deadly weapon, child endangerment, and battery against a police officer. Both her daughter and the male bystander were taken to a nearby hospital with what were described as moderate injuries. Number 6. Courtney Reschke In 2012, an Idaho woman was taken into police custody after reports surfaced that she'd engaged in intimate relations with multiple teenagers to whom she'd been acquainted through her oldest son. Upon investigating the woman's predatory behavior, the authorities discovered that Courtney Reschke, aged 35, had plied her victims with alcohol before having intercourse with them in her Kuna home. According to the arrest report, the woman's other son, aged five, had at one point attempted to enter her bedroom during a rendezvous with one of the several teenage boys she was accused of victimizing. The child was unable to open the locked door, however, and Reshk allegedly ignored his cries for help, instead opting to continue having relations with her elder son's friend. The mother of two was ultimately charged with 11 felony counts and an additional seven misdemeanor counts, which included dispensing alcohol to minors. In June of 2013, Reshk was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison with the possibility of parole after 36 months. Number 5. Amber Stevenson In June of 2015, a brawl broke out between 34-year-old Amber Stevenson and Rebecca Mills, aged 39, at a Walmart in Beach Grove, Indiana. According to eyewitnesses, Stevenson had instigated the physical encounter at about 10 p.m. and had even encouraged her six-year-old son to aid her in her efforts of besting Mills during the fight. While speaking about the incident on a local radio program called The Smiley Morning Show, Stevenson claimed to have heard the other female shopper use a racial slur when referring to a store employee. Outraged, she subsequently confronted Mills about her offensive language and a physical altercation ensued in the middle of the shampoo aisle. A bystander then took out his cell phone and began filming the two women as they fought. Concerned witnesses pleaded with them to stop as Stevenson's young son looked on while being in close proximity to the skirmish. As was shown in the video recording, Stevenson ultimately called upon her son for assistance after Mills had successfully pinned her to the ground. The boy proceeded to strike Mills several times and also threw shampoo bottles in her direction in an attempt to aid his mother. Beach Grove police were eventually called to the store, but no charges were issued at the scene to either of the women involved. One witness claimed to have observed responding officers laughing upon being shown the recording of the brawl. The employee, whom Mills had addressed in the moments leading up to the fight, denied that the woman had called her a racial epitaph. Following an investigation by local authorities, Stevenson was arrested and charged with neglecting a dependent and contributing to the delinquency of a minor in relation to her son's involvement in the fight. Number 4. Edith Riddle A Florida woman named Edith Riddle was arrested on child abuse charges after she'd allegedly beaten up her daughter's school rival on March the 18th of 2021. According to First Coast News, Riddle was wearing a boxing glove at the time of the attack. She claimed to have accidentally superglued the piece of fighting equipment to her wrist and was therefore unable to remove it. The police report detailed how the 34-year-old Jacksonville resident had just concluded a meeting with the vice principal of DuPont Middle School in the moments that preceded the attack. Riddle and her daughter were making their way off of school grounds when they confronted the victim outside the cafeteria. The woman's daughter initiated the physical altercation by pushing the young girl, who was described as the child's rival, and punching her repeatedly as she was lying on the ground. Riddle allegedly delivered several blows to the victim as well, bludgeoning the defenseless girl with the boxing glove. A teacher who'd witnessed the fight reportedly made a frantic announcement over the loudspeaker at 12.14 p.m. Shortly thereafter, a school safety officer arrived at the scene and broke up the altercation. Riddle, who was subsequently dubbed Boxing Glove Mum by the media, was taken into custody by Duval School Board Police. 
Number 3. Gulzar Banu In September of 2021, a woman from Karnataka, India, was accused of murdering her own daughter in an effort to conceal the details of her extramarital affair. On the 5th of the month, local police recovered the body of Parvina Banu, aged 28, which they'd found in a dry well from a small village close to where the family lived. Although the authorities initially hypothesized that the woman had taken her own life, a post-mortem examination of Parvina's remains indicated that she'd been strangled to death. Investigators reviewed the victim's cell phone records, whereupon they discovered that she'd been in contact with her mother, Gulza, and uncle, Paya Rejin, shortly before her death. Upon being pressed by detectives, both Gulza and Paya Rejin confessed to have carried out Parvina's murder on September the 4th. According to the police superintendent of the Chikabalapura district, Parvina had recently learned that her mother and uncle were having an affair. The pair thus plotted to kill the young woman in order to keep their relationship a secret from Gulzar's husband, Fias. Paya Rejin had allegedly been the one to perpetrate the killing, which involved him strangling Parvina with a jacket. Gulzar successfully made her husband an accomplice after convincing him that she'd murdered their daughter for marrying a man from a different religion. Fires helped the two killers transport Parvina's body to the well where she was later found by the police. All three of the victim's relatives were arrested and charged in connection to the murder. Number 1. Donna Scrivo A 61-year-old Michigan woman murdered and dismembered her adult son in January of 2014. During the criminal trial that followed the gruesome incident, the accused mother, Donna Scrivo, attempted to convince the jury that she'd been an innocent victim in the situation. Her defense attorney claimed that she'd been held hostage by an unidentified masked intruder. According to Scrivo's testimony, the supposed assailant had imprisoned her for a total of five days in her St. Clair Shores home. During that time frame, the intruder allegedly strangled the woman's 32-year-old son, Ramsey Scrivo, before mutilating the man's corpse. The defendant's version of the circumstances surrounding her son's death was firmly rejected by the jury assigned to her case. Scrivo was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder and other related charges. One of the crucial pieces of evidence that the prosecution had focused its attention on during the trial was a bus saw that Scrivo had allegedly purchased from a home improvement store. Investigators had established that the same saw had been used to cut up Ramsey's dead body. The dismembered portions were then placed in several trash bags and left on the side of the road at four separate locations. CCTV footage had captured Scrivo near the area where her son's discarded body parts were later found. Scrivo, who was a registered nurse, had also been Ramsey's certified caretaker as the man reportedly suffered from a mental illness that left him unable to care for himself. His mother had allegedly tranquilized him with a dosage of Xanax before she strangled him to death and mutilated his remains. Thanks for watching. Would you slap your mum in public for $50,000? Let us know in the comments section below.